Okay, we're ready to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. There's actually two parts to it, and uh, many of you would probably uh, enjoy the second part a little bit more because this, the second part of this, of this theorem tells you how to compute definite integrals the easy way. But uh, we, we talk about the first part um, because the first part is going to help us prove the second part. Before I tell you what the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says, let's just look at this idea in general. Differentiation and integration, in a sense, are inverse operations. Let's not worry about the limit sign just yet, but when you, when you, when you have a derivative, don't you subtract uh, and then you divide, right? Uh, what's the inverse operation of this? What's the inverse operation of division? Multiplication. When you have a, say, a Riemann sum like right here, you would first multiply, that's the inverse operation of division, and then you would add these up, that's the inverse operation of, um, of subtraction. So in a way, very loosely, you, you, could, you could think of uh, differ differentiation and uh, integration as being inverse operations. And that's kind of what the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 says. Remember this function g of x? This function g of x is actually the area under the graph of f of t from a to x. So think of this as the area so far function. What the fundamental theorem um, Part one says as long as the function is continuous, then uh, the rate of change of this area of function with respect to x tells you how fast this this area is increasing is equal to the function its itself. For example, if the function were the zero function y equals zero, then the area wouldn't change. The rate is zero. What if what if the function f of x is a constant a horizontal line, a constant function? They wouldn't you say the area is increasing at a constant rate? If, if the function is a horizontal line, the rate at which the area is increasing is constant. If the function is positive, then the, ra it, the area is getting bigger. If the function dips down below the, the t-axis here, then the area would be getting the net area would be getting uh, less. So the rate is, is 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 negative. So it does seem reasonable at least that the rate of change of the area should be <clears throat> have something to do with the function itself. Anyway, so. Uh, but what it's saying is the derivative, if, if you think of this function g of x uh, as, as a function of x, the derivative of this function with respect to x is equal to the function evaluated at x. So what's, so let's look at this. What's the derivative with respect to x of this definite inter integral? Well, as long as the variable you're taking the derivative with respect of is the same, <coughs> uh, exact same variable as in the upper limit of integration, then it's just the function, the integrand, evaluated at the upper limit. Notice the bottom limit, as long as it's a constant, doesn't really affect your answer. It drops out. It could be 0, it could be 5, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, what, what's this one equal to? Be careful on this one. This is tricky. Teachers love these kinds of questions here. Uh, the answer to this one is 0, because this definite integral, remember, whenever you have a definite integral from, say, 0 to 3, this is a number. You might not be able to tell me exactly what that number is, you know it exists because the, integ the integrand is continuous, so the derivative of a constant is zero. You wouldn't use the fundamental theorem part one now. Okay, this is where it gets a little tricky, right, right here. <clears throat> uh, so the variable you take the derivative with respect to, as long as it's the upper limit of integration, is just the function evaluated <clears throat> at that upper limit. What if you want to find the derivative with respect to x of this thing? Notice, we don't, we don't have x here, we have a function here. What we're going to do is this. We're going to let u. We're going to make a, a substitution and use the chain rule here. If you let u equal x squared plus one, and let's also let f of x equal the integral from say zero to x of cosine t, then this thing right here, g of x, is the same as f of u, isn't it? Notice that g of x is f of u. Uh, the integral from zero to u of cosine t dt is the same as this because u equals x squared plus one. So that's important. G of x is f of u. So what is g prime of x? Well. It's the derivative of this with respect to x. By the chain rule, it's the derivative of f with respect to u. But look, f is right here. You, you can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1 to this first part, because the derivative of f with respect to u is just going to be um, cosine u. And the, derivative of, and the derivative of u with respect to x is easy. It's just 2x. So you got to set it up to just right. I would go one step further and write it as um, cosine of quantity x squared plus 1 times 2x. Kind of sneaky, isn't it? Now this is even a little bit sneakier. If you have something like this, what you do here is you would um, 
if you want to take the derivative of this function from x to x squared plus 1 of this thing, you would start off by breaking it into two cases. One of our properties of integration, if integration says you can do that. You can, you can go from x to 0 of this thing plus 0 to x squared of this thing. Furthermore, we can use another property that says the uh, derivative, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, when you switch the limits of integration, I'm trying to get the x on top, you have to put a negative sign here. So you, you write it like this. This one's going to be easy to take the derivative of, because when you take the derivative of this piece, uh, the negative factors out is just going to be uh, square root of x squared plus 1 by the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1. This one, however, we're going to have to do what we just did. We're going to have to make a, a substitution. So here we go. I'm focusing on this one now. Let f of x be the integral from 0 to x of this thing, and let u equal x squared. So f of u would be this, and that's exactly what this integral is. Uh, g f of u equals, equals this integral. So g of x could be written as this. g prime of x is the derivative of this piece, which is this, and what's the derivative of f of u with respect to x? It's f prime of u times u prime of x. f prime of u, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one, we're, 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 we're t applying that to this because the derivative is with respect to this upper inner, inner upper limit. We get this, and then let's express it in terms of x, re replace u with x squared. Kind of sneaky, huh? Let's do, let's do this last problem. I think you'll like this. Suppose I have this function f of t here. And let, let g of x equal the integral from a to x of f of t d, dt. Remember what this is? This is the area so far. It tells you how much area is under the curve so far from, from in this case, uh, actually I want this to be 0. Sorry, folks. This should be 0 to x. All right? All right. So at what values of x do the local and maximum of g occur? Well, let, let's just take a look at it. g starts out to be 0 at 0, right? And that as x increases, isn't this area going to be getting more? So the area g of x is going up. But then look, if as f goes negative now, uh, you're going to start getting negative area. So this is a local max, isn't it, here? So it turns out you're going to have a local max here. Now when you're adding negative area over to here, and then you start adding positive area, uh, you have a local min of g of x here. And then um, here uh, you have a local max at 3. And uh, that's it. You know, we wouldn't call this a local min because it doesn't turn there. So, so there's your answer. Where does g attain an absolute max? Well, uh, if you think of it this way, g, g of 0 equals 0. It's getting bigger, right? This, this you can actually just about approximate how much area this is. This is what it would be. Um, this, this is a local max, but notice you're, you're subtracting more away from it then you're adding here. Does this look like more area negative than positive? So this other local max is going to be smaller than this one, isn't it? So x equal 1 would be, would be where it occurs. All right, now here, here's where it gets kind of sneaky too. Um, let's see. On what intervals is g concave downward? Okay, well g is concave downward whenever g prime is de decreasing. But look, but g prime, what is g, g prime? By the fundamental theorem of calculus, g prime is f of x. So all you have to do is figure out where f of x is decreasing, and that'll be where, where, where g is concave downward. f is going to be decreasing from 0 to 1.5, and again from 2.5 to 3.5. Okay, let's do one last thing. I'll, I'll ask you to do this. What if you wanted to sketch a graph of g? I want you to sketch a graph of this function g of x, which is the area so, so far function. I'll give you a hint on it, though. Why don't, why don't you use the fact that, remember what g of x is? It's the area so far function. g prime is greater than 0 whenever g is increasing. But, but g prime equals f. Remember that? So, so uh, g prime is going to be greater than 0 whenever um, g is increasing. That means wherever f is greater than 0, g will be increasing. Wherever f is increasing, g will be concave up and the local extrema of f occur at the inflection points of g. So see if you can figure that out. See if you can sketch the graph of the, of the um, function. I get this. I get this for the graph of g. Recall the, the, um, the, the, um, in the local extrema of f will be the inflection points of g, and whatever f changes sign, those are going to be the local max and min. Pretty sneaky, huh? 
All right. Well, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.